Well, let's go ahead and start. Let's, um, our guest speaker tonight is David Peterman. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Utah. And he, as uh, it said in his blurb on our website, uses computer simula simulations and robotics to reconstruct the biomechanics of extinct animals. So we're gonna see, I believe, some uh, robotic ammonites here. And I don't know if he's gonna push his, I, I think he's gonna push his uh, 3D printings, but I saw some of his 3D ammonite prints Oh, two weekends ago, I was down with a friend in Florida who had some. They're pretty darn cool. There, I said it, David. <laughs> they're really neat, and I think he is going to show us some. If they're not in your slideshow, you got one right there on your lap. Um, I I have a lot of. I'm sorry, I, I had a million applications open, so I was looking for the uh, presentation. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah I, this this just finished today. This is from a scan in mm -hmm. our museum. Uh, it's a uh, Hoplites dentatus. And I've reconstructed the soft body. So this is something that I do for teaching specimens. Uh, I've been experimenting with different types of filament that just look really cool. Uh, there are also other applications for this. This is changes color depending on the orientation that you view it from. Um, I started with heteromorphs, uh, of course, because they're uh, some of the hardest to find complete. So uh, that was a good way to use for teaching specimens for these really rare ones. And then, uh, I also have some 3D prints that, uh, or I've reconstructed the internal morphology, so you can see the septa inside of the shells, uh, and we use those for teaching as well. Very cool. All right, and I think uh, with that, if you guys have any questions as we're running along here, I think uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and if you preface your question with uh, just type in question in capital letters so that we know it's a question and not just someone saying that was cool. And that way we can find the questions at the end much easier. And that is a word easily. I just found out about the Texas Prime scam. Kids getting diagnosed with a learning disability. So they can get All right. David, you want to start? Yeah. What's up, David? Did I hear you uh, say My something? computer says that the internet connection is unstable and I've got a high powered one. And that means there's too many people with their picture on. Really? Okay, so let's ask people to just un undo their video camera. Thanks, Dave. And that'll make things flow smoothly. And we'll even do ours ourselves. Okay, right, Mel? Um, and David, if you want to just start, uh, share your screen, and we'll take it from the top here. Welcome, David Peterman, to Casper, Wyoming, via the internet. All right. Can, uh, can everybody see, see my uh, PowerPoint? Yep. Is it, is it working? It's working. Great. All right. I might as well get started then. Uh, as JP mentioned, uh, for this talk, I'll focus on some experiments with biomimetic robots and other 3D printed models. And uh, we use these models to evaluate the biomechanical properties of uh, various extinct marine animals. Uh, this talk will largely focus on planus spiral cephalopods, so aminoids and nautiloids. I'm going to go ahead and move this uh, minimized view. Uh, so uh, I'm currently a postdoc in the AM lab at the University of Utah, the Aminoid Motility Modeling Laboratory. And we're interested in reconstructing the biomechanics of mostly externally shelled cephalopods using a variety of modeling approaches, ranging from virtual computer simulations to physical models on uh, 3D prints and more recently robots. And we use these models to disentangle the modes of life and paleoecology of the living animals. Uh, so for this talk, I'm only focusing on planar spirals, regularly coiled uh, aminoids and nautiloids. Uh, so these are just shells that coil within a plane. And I've, I've highlighted them on the uh, uh, on this generalized phylogeny to the right, where we have aminoids in red and nautiloids in the blue. And I just wanted to mention that uh, both of these groups are uh, were very successful for hundreds of millions of years. They are major components of marine ecosystems. And they leave behind a really de detailed and complete fossil record, which makes them 
really good tools to study evolutionary biomechanics, how functional morphology shapes evolutionary patterns through time. And uh, these animals had a chambered shell that functioned as a buoyancy apparatus. So this allowed them to adjust the liquid to gas ratio in their shells to maintain a condition close to neutral buoyancy. And the shape of this shell uh, controls the distribution of, of organismal mass, the mass balance that the living animal would have experienced. And also the external shape constrains hydrodynamics, how the living animal would have interacted with the surrounding water that it moves through. Uh, so there's a pretty remarkable degree of morphological disparity just within plain spiral cephalopods. And uh, this level of disparity suggests that there's a very wide range of physical properties that would have constrained the life habits of these animals and their swimming capabilities. Uh, so just to highlight the, the disparity of these animals, I've chosen three uh, different morphotypes. Uh, on the bottom left, we have oxycones. These are uh, are sharp shells. They are laterally compressed. They have really high whorl expansion and they don't expose their previous whorls all that much. So these intuitively are the more streamlined morphologies. And then in the middle, I've selected a serpenticone. Uh, it looks like a coiled snake. It has uh, lots of exposure of its previous whorls. It's laterally compressed. And on the right, we have spherocones. They're sphere-like. So I'll be using these terms throughout the presentation. Uh, and these represent some end members of the morphologies that I'll be experimenting upon. So uh, I, I specialize in using 3D reconstructions to investigate biomechanics. Uh, externally shelled cephalopods are excellent targets to reconstruct with these techniques because their shells constrain the internal volumes of uh, their chambers, so the liquid to gas ratio within their chambers, but also the soft body that occupy the body chamber. And then the external interface of the shell constrains not only hydrodynamics, but the volume of water displaced. So all of these properties allow uh, very detailed analyses of uh, various physical properties that the living animals would have experienced. And when I create these digital models, I use a variety of modeling approaches ranging from 3D scanning to CT scanning and photogrammetry, but ultimately I end with a mathematical reconstruction of the shell. Uh, so this is reminiscent of, of Ralph's work a little bit, uh, but I use this technique because it allows me to reconstruct the internal components of the shell, like the divider walls, the septa, uh, and also the chamber contents with the same equations that I use to build the external shell. And really quick, I just want to give an overview of some of the physical properties of interest. Uh, when I refer to hydrostatic properties, this is just a branch of fluid mechanics uh, that concerns the physical properties that submerged bodies experience in a static, non-moving setting. Uh, so first are the conditions for neutral buoyancy. Uh, these animals regulate the liquid to gas ratio in their shells and the amount of the, 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 the uh, volume of the chambers within their shells can tell us if they had the capacity for neutral buoyancy, depending on the volumes and densities of each other material of unique density. So it depends on the uh, total mass of the soft body shell, the liquid and gas ratio in their shells. Um, and when that's equal to the mass of water displaced, then they're capable of neutral buoyancy. This is just Archimedes principle. Uh, the next property, which I'll talk about quite a bit, is hydrostatic stability. Uh, stability governs their resistance to rocking. Uh, so we could, we could quantify this property as the distance between the centers of buoyancy and mass, which is then normalized by the cube root of volume. And this is termed the hydrostatic stability index. And uh, I use this index because it's uh, a dimensionless number. It's independent of size and shape. There's and should be a volume somewhere. I don't know how to do this. Uh, and, and when I refer to the center of buoyancy, that's just the center of the volume of water displaced by the living animal. And the center of mass is a little bit more complicated because the total center of mass is essentially a weighted average. And it depends upon the local centers of mass of each material of unique density. So these arrows point to the local centers of mass computed. Uh, this is just a generalized diagram here. And I've only considered four materials of unique density, so they're essentially bulk density values. Uh, but each of these materials have their own 3D distribution of centers of mass. And a 
a larger volume and or a larger density will pull the mass distribution closer to that object. Um, and also we could determine the orientation that the living animal would assume in the water column using these approaches because by definition in a static setting the center of buoyancy and mass have to be vertically aligned because there is uh, the buoyant force acting on the center of buoyancy pointing away from the center of the earth and then there's uh, the force of uh, gravity acting on the organismal mass acting on the center of mass that points towards the center of the earth. So you have two opposing forces that are keeping these hydrostatic centers uh, vertically aligned. And then throughout the presentation, I'll use the similar notation with these cones pointing to towards the uh, centers of buoyancy and mass, specifically the tips of the cones. And just a quick outline, the first half of the, the presentation will focus on some self-propelling biomimetic robots. And uh, these were designed to investigate hydrodynamics, the consequences of external shell shape. And then the second round of experiments, I've uh, investigated hydrostatic stability. So the consequences of mostly the internal shell shape and coiling parameters. And uh, I'll frequently use this, uh, this uh, way to conceptualize the morphous space of planar spiral cephalopods. Um, this, this has been termed the Vestermann morphous space. It's essentially a ternary diagram where every planar spiral shell is represented by a point that can be quantified that the plots on this space. Uh, this is really similar to some ternary diagrams we see in uh, sedimentology work, where uh, in this case, if it plots close to the bottom of the triangle, then that means it has an increased whirl expansion. These are more streamlined oxycone shapes. Uh, the top left means it has more umbilical exposure, exposure of the previous whirls. And the top right means it's more laterally inflated, so more sphere-like. Oh, and I want to mention that each of the models that you'll see, the robots, the hydrostatic models, everything, they have the same volume and mass. Uh, so I'm not necessarily investigating uh, the influence of scale. So certain properties change as a function of size, uh, but and this is a, a way to isolate variables. Uh, so using this Vestrum on morphous space, uh, I've had to pick a couple uh, points to investigate these disparate morphologies of planar spiral cephalopods. Uh, but there are a lot of differences, a lot of different factors that, that I had to essentially neutralize that influence mostly the hydrostatic, so internal morphological characteristics that influence the, the, the mass distribution and how much mass the shell occupies and so on. So in order to isolate these variables, I've taken a CT scan Nautilus shell and essentially morphed the shell to occupy different points in the morphous space. So I have three end members of the morphous space, the oxycone, serpenticone, and spherocone, and then the morphous space center, which you could think of as uh, an average of these shapes uh, in terms of coiling parameters, but also whirl section shape. So I, these are this is a perfect mathematical average. It's an isometric shell that represents the uh, average of all these all of these variables. And uh, you might notice that instead of having ammonitic septa, these have uh, nautilus-like septa. Uh, also, nautilus-like septal spacing and shell and septal thickness. All of these. Uh, all of these choices were to isolate the variable of just coiling parameter shell shape and how that influences uh, both hydrostatics and hydrodynamics. Uh, so to create these biomimetic robots, uh, I created a virtual hydrostatic model that represents this, this theoretical morphology. And I, uh, when I make these, when I make these robots, I have to uh, account for the fact that I can't 3D print to the exact same uh, shapes, the exact same densities as the, the materials that make up the living animal. And uh, I have uh, lots of other components that, that need to be uh, accounted for. So uh, I've essentially run a hydrostatic analysis on all of these color-coded materials here so that I could replicate a similar mass distribution to the virtual model. So I solved for the position of a counterweight and the local center of mass of the 3D printed plastic shell that allow this model to have the same orientation inferred by the virtual theoretical model. And another, uh, another method, a uh, uh, design choice to isolate uh, the, the variable of hydrostatics for these particular 
uh, experiments was to exaggerate hydrostatic stability. So you might notice that the distance between the centers of buoyancy and mass for the robots are much higher than the distance between the centers of buoyancy and mass for the virtual models. And this was to nullify the effect of these animals producing jet thrust and moving backwards. And if this thrust vector isn't aligned with the hydrostatic centers, they're going to experience rocking. Uh, so in this case, we just wanted to look at external shell shape and how they respond to horizontal backwards movement. And the propulsion mechanism to make this movement uh, is uh, an impeller-driven water pump. So you can see on the top right that there is a, an impeller-driven uh, mantle cavity that sucks water in. Uh, it's it's uh, creating centrifugal acceleration, making a partial vacuum, and then it jets water out of a uh, 3D printed hyponome. So it's it's producing similar thrust, similar wake dynamics to the the living animals. And uh, I've adjusted the voltage of the motor so that it's producing around 0.3 newtons of thrust, which uh, is equivalent to a time average thrust value of a similar size Nautilus. So these are producing Nautilus-like thrust, and we're essentially drag racing different shapes uh, of, of these robots. And they also have buoyancy chambers that allow them to be calibrated in water. And I uh, have uh, a self-healing rubber cap that fits over top of this chamber, and then I'm able to adjust the buoyancy uh, by inserting or removing liquid with a syringe. And on these models, I've placed two tracking points, and I've used 3D motion tracking to monitor the location of these tracking points to monitor various kinematic properties as a function of time. And to, uh, uh, to use 3D motion tracking, I've developed a uh, submersible camera rig with two waterproof cameras that are pointed at the subject. And the robot is then steadied with a grabber tool. I release it, make sure that it's not rocking or experiencing significant uh, movement in any direction. And then once it's stable, I have a fiber optic cable that's attached to the grabber tool. And then it uh, shines all the way through the 3D printed model, hits a sensor in the inside, and tells it to pulse for exactly one second, delivering three newtons of thrust during that time. And then I monitor the, the kinematics with the motion tracking program DLT DVA. This is a, a free program out of Ty Hedrick's lab at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's a great program. And uh, along with a calibration package in MATLAB, I, I use it to uh, automatically track the position of the tracking points with machine learning and then transform those pixel coordinates to uh, 3D coordinates in meters. And uh, this is what just the the, uh, the gross position looks like for all trials. I've done multiple trials on all these experiments. And I, the reason why I'm showing this is because each of the trials experiences subtle differences in positive and negative buoyancy. Uh, they might rise or sink a little bit because perfect neutral buoyancy is, uh, is, is pretty much impossible to reach. Uh, just a, a few drops of water surplus or deficiency could cause these models to sink or rise. And uh, also they respond to random uh, ambient pool currents as well. But despite all of these differences, when we compute velocity, we see that uh, it's very well constrained. So velocity is plotted on the uh, y-axis and time on the x-axis. And here the trials are color-coded. So we see that each of the trials are very well constrained and that our compressed morphotypes, our serpenticone and oxycone on top, uh, they reach higher velocities on a single jet, and they also coast farther. They have improved uh, uh, coasting efficiency and course stabilization, and here I've termed that hydrodynamic stability. They're more stable jetting in a particular direction compared to the inflated morphotypes. And the same property of the inflated morphotypes being more susceptible to yaw in response to the single jet uh, made it impossible to, with the, with this particular camera set up, to monitor uh, velocity during multiple jets. So here, um, I've only done this with the uh, the compressed morphotypes, the serpenticone on the left and the oxycone on the right. So this is after a sequence of jets. Uh, the shaded regions are the times the motor was active, so for one second, and they had a one second refill interval. And we see that even though they have similar uh, velocities after a single jet, once we have multiple jets, the hydrodynamic drag of the serpenticone is catching up to it and it's reaching some maximum velocity. Uh, so it's able to, to uh, adjust after three jets 
reach velocities that are a little bit higher than what extant nautilus are able to reach. So they're about 25 centimeters per second or so uh, for equivalent sized uh, nautilus. And the octicone is able to reach velocities twice as high. And again, these, these, these velocities pale in comparison to uh, lots of marine animals, most notably fish. Uh, they, they are definitely not built for speed, even these more streamlined morphologies. Um, let's see. And then the uh, ease of yawing for the inflated, the more sphere-like sphere morphotypes prompted some experiments on their yaw maneuverability, how easily they can uh, spin about the vertical axis. So to investigate this property, I've fitted a, uh, a, essentially a 90 degree elbow. This is a hyponome attachment that fits over top the existing hyponome. And this is 90 degrees relative to the lever arm that passes from the source of jet thrust through the vertical axis that passes through the hydrostatic centers. So what this means is that once it delivers a jet, uh, same one second jet, it's, it's transmitting this energy into pure torque about that vertical axis to monitor its spinning. And I have two tracking points placed on top of the models here to uh, monitor the kinematics during this type of movement. And I've plotted the inflated morphotypes on top, the compressed morphotypes on bottom. And then on the y-axis is the net angle from start in degrees uh, through time. And again, trials are color-coded here. So the shaded region is the time the motor was active. And just after a single jet pulse, we see that the spherocone is able to reach uh, uh, 1,200 degrees total within about 15 seconds or so. And then the oxycone is about an order of magnitude lower. It spins about 100 degrees, and then it just, it just comes to rest shortly afterwards because it has these really broad flanks. And even though it's more discoid and has a larger lever arm, its uh, hydrodynamics are preventing it from uh, spinning as freely as, as, as uh, the inflated morphotypes. And if we look at angular velocity, so this is just uh, the derivative of the previous uh, plots, uh, we see that, uh, again, the spherocones can more easily accelerate when they turn about that vertical axis compared to the oxycones. In fact, they have angular velocities about five times higher, uh, which is a pretty big deal. And this this uh, highlights a trade-off between hydrodynamic stability, uh, that coasting efficiency, and yaw maneuverability, how easy it is to spin about the vertical axis. So our uh, more compressed morphotypes, our oxycones and sericones, they had improved coasting efficiency, better directional control, and course stabilization. And this is consistent with having better directional swimmers. And uh, I, I don't like the idea of of using terms uh, better or worse or good or bad when referring to biomechanics, because uh, if I ask somebody the if a if a cheetah is better than a penguin, hopefully the next question would be at what uh, swimming or running. Uh, so even though uh, we regard these planar spiral cephalopods as uh, pretty simple animals that experience the very very similar. Uh, physical properties that would have constrained their life habits, we see, in fact, there are some pretty severe differences uh, within the planar spiral morphous space. Uh, and for these inflated morphotypes, we see that, again, they have improved yaw maneuverability, which means that they had improved 360 degree access to uh, prey items in the vicinity. And when turning, they would limit self-generated wake. So they're not uh, uh, scooping away whatever uh, prey items are in the vicinity of the living animal. So uh, while they wouldn't have been well suited to uh, rapid horizontal movement, they would have been much better at uh, turning maneuvers. And this raises the question what maneuverability even means. Uh, we've uh, In the literature, you see maneuverability referring to turning efficiency or directional control. Uh, a lot of amenatologists concern uh, they, they regard uh, uh, oxycones, the laterally compressed morphotypes, uh, as being more maneuverable because they have more directional control simply because they have a keel. And uh, if, you if you choose to define maneuverability that way, then uh, that totally makes sense. But I just want to mention that these are two uh, completely opposing forces that act on rigid bodied animals. And also having a rigid body, lacking the, this capability of undulatory swimming like fish, 
makes them more similar to RUVs than most marine animals. Uh, so they had pretty unique uh, constraints acting on them that would have uh, influenced their swimming capabilities and life habits. Uh, they generally have much higher hydrostatic stability than most fish. Fish are very hydrostatically unstable in general, and often they're hydrostatically inverted, which is one of the reasons why they go belly up when they die. And again, uh, these unique physical properties impose some pretty severe constraints uh, also on uh, pitch maneuverability, how easy it is to change uh, their pitch, which leads me into the next round of experiments with the hydrostatic models. Uh, so hydrostatic simulations of these four models uh, and also Nautilus uh, demonstrate that most planar spirals had very low hydrostatic stability, much lower than extant Nautilus, around 15% to 50%. Uh, this is because aminoids with larger body chamber ratios, uh, those that have lower whirl expansion, uh, they wrap their soft body around the chambered portion of the shell. So they're raising their total mass distribution closer to the center of buoyancy by doing this, and this reduces hydrostatic stability pretty consistently. Um, and this begs the question if Nautilus is even a valid analog to use for the majority of the, the uh, cephalopod morphous base. Of course, there are uh, plenty of uh, anatomical, physiological differences between uh, the extant nautilids and uh, all plain and spiral cephalopods like the aminoids to ever exist. Uh, so there, there are other, uh, other factors that would have influenced the, the swimming capabilities of these living animals, but this is just the... Uh, uh, the hydrostatic component attributed to shell shape that I'm referring to right now. So uh, this uh, analyzing the hydrostatics uh, in a physical setting presented some really weird engineering challenges. Uh, for the hydrostatically unstable morphotypes, uh, to give you a sense of scale, this serpenticone uh, is about, about a kilogram. Uh, it's, it's about 20 centimeters in diameter. Uh, so rather large, but even so, the distance between its centers of buoyancy and mass are only, uh, th th that distance is only about one and a half millimeters. So that means that if I was off by uh, engineering this mass distribution in a physical model uh, by a few millimeters, then the model would be swimming upside down. It could be hydrostatically inverted. Uh, so uh, I, I had to develop a technique to in part, uh, the mass distribution of the virtual models with unprecedented levels of, of accuracy. And uh, I, I did this uh, by developing a counterweight apparatus that's threaded. It's a threaded brass counterweight that's, that was machined to uh, fit on a high thread pitch screw. And this allows the total center of mass to be calibrated and water. Uh, it also compensates for uh, differences in water densities because uh, if this model was placed in a, uh, a slightly different setting for which it was in, uh, pr uh, engineered for, like let's say that the water temperature was a little bit higher, then that would adjust the buoyancy. The buoyancy would decrease, which means that the mass distribution would be affected by the amount of liquid in, in the uh, buoyancy chamber. So there are some feedback loops that present some challenges. Uh, so... Ultimately, the process is to make this neutrally buoyant uh, first and then uh, unscrew the counterweight so that the centers of buoyancy and mass coincide. And I know that I reached this condition when the model doesn't want to assume any particular orientation in the water. It's just floating like an astronaut in space. That means the centers of buoyancy and mass occupy the same spot. And uh, having a, a mobile counterweight that's some fraction of the total mass, in this case, it's a quarter of the total mass, magnifies this one and a half millimeters because it means that the counterweight needs to move four times the separation between the centers of buoyancy and mass. Uh, so that makes it so I'm not, uh, uh, I'm able to magnify these very small distances a little bit. Uh, so after I identify the zero stability condition, I just compute the number of screw turns. I know the thread pitch of the screw, so every turn results in, uh, in this case, uh, 0.5 millimeters of movement in a particular direction. So I could compute the number of screw turns to impart the proper hydrostatic stability by pulling the total center of mass into its proper location. And uh, I have tracking points placed on the model. These are uh, vertically aligned in, uh, this time. 
so I monitor their location with the same uh, camera rig, but this time I had to consistently rotate the models uh, uh, for, for each of the trials. So I developed a mechanical arm apparatus that grips the model and consistently rotates it about 55 degrees on this hinge mechanism and then releases it. And, it, and that allows me to mo monitor the hydrodynamic restoration uh, versus hydrostatic stability. So again, I want to reiterate that each of these models have the same uh, volume and mass. And uh, the procedure was to rotate them aperture forwards, which is shown here, and then aperture backwards uh, in the other direction, about 55 degrees each way. And I've also recalibrated the counterweights after every five trials for a total of 15 trials in either direction. And uh, this, uh, this allows us to investigate if, if human error in identifying the zero stability condition uh, influences the rotational kinematics of these of these robots. And uh, it, it turns out that it, it really it, it really didn't. Uh, this is a pretty robust way of imparting the right hydrostatic properties. And some of the kinematics that I monitored during these experiments were uh, position, the angle displaced, and angular velocity. Uh, so here I've plotted the 3D position of, uh, of these particular models. I've used an, the uh, model of the Nautilus with the right hydrostatic properties, uh, the same oxycone, serpenticone, and spherocone as the robotic models. And the reason why I'm showing the 3D position is because movement is very complicated. Uh, these, are, these are experiencing, uh, uh, the, the, the experiments last for quite a long time, between 15 and 30 seconds. And uh, movement is pretty complicated. Each path is unique. They're experiencing, um, instead of just pitch rocking, they're experiencing uh, roll, yaw, translation, out of plane rotation. So they're, they're essentially behaving like a spherical pendulum, uh, which has some pretty complicated movement. But despite all this, when we compute the angle displays from the static orientation, which is plotted in all, all the y-axes as a function of time, we see that each of the 15 trials in either direction are remarkably similar. Uh, when I first plotted this data, I was so surprised because very infrequently do we see uh, some something in nature follow uh, a, a simple equation from a textbook. Uh, usually there are so many assumptions that in, in so much chaos in, in, in the natural world that we we, we never have this perfectly repeatable behavior. Uh, so I was very surprised to see that. And there's a, a more complicated equation that, that, that describes these kinematics specifically. And uh, it's the same equation uh, for a, uh, a, a simple pendulum interacting with air resistance and gravity. So the experience is harmonic oscillation, uh, specifically under damped harmonic oscillation. And these gray lines are uh, the, uh, computed from the damping coefficients of the Nautilus here. So uh, the gray lines are the same on all of the plots. And this just gives a sense of uh, how similar the rocking is to the rocking experienced by the Nautilus. And right away, we see that the unstable morphotypes, the hydrostatically unstable morphotypes on the bottom, the serpenticone and the spherocone, experience uh, much uh, lower damping coefficients, it takes a longer time for them to uh, reach some rocking value that the Nautilus does, but also they have lower angular frequency. They're experiencing less frequent oscillations as well. Uh, so more gentle movement, and this is indicative of them experiencing uh, uh, weaker restoring moments acting to return them back to that stable equilibrium orientation. Uh, so this is just a, a look at the angular velocity real quick just to get a sense of the speed of oscillations. We see that the Nautilus and Oxycone have much stronger restoring moments. They're experiencing much quicker movement where the unstable morphotypes are experiencing more gentle oscillations. And this illuminates another trade-off between stability and maneuverability. But in this case, it's hydrostatic stability instead of hydrodynamic stability and pitch maneuverability instead of yaw maneuverability. So uh, with improved hydrostatic stability, this means that the living animals would be more resistant to rocking from uh, their own uh, their own jetting. We know that Nautilus experiences a considerable amount of rocking, mostly because it's using retractor muscles to uh, ex expel water out of the mantle cavity, which is probably different than what aminoids did. Uh, but if this had lower hydrostatic stability, then this would be rocking all over the place, maybe even pinwheeling in some cases. Uh, so its stability is enough to keep it within a, a, a particular functional orientation. Uh, 
And higher hydrostatic stability is better for uh, more efficient directional swimmers, but also it's more important for reducing the sensitivity to the jetting direction because uh, a less stable morphotype, if its thrust vector is misaligned with its hydrostatic centers, then it's, it's going to experience rocking. If it's perfectly aligned, then it'll perfectly translate within uh, in that particular direction. But uh, more stable cephalopods have a larger swath of thrust vectors that result in efficient movement. Uh, so even though the Nautilus is not that streamlined, uh, it falls into the latter category. It undergoes uh, vertical movements pretty regularly. And if it had lower hydrostatic stability, this would be much more awkward for the living animal. Uh, so it's important for uh, directional movement in the sense of uh, swimming efficiency, but also in terms of uh, jetting in particular directions, especially for vertical migration. And uh, uh, the consequences of low hydrostatic stability uh, I, I have already discussed, but some of the uh, advantages are that they have improved maneuverability. They could modify their orientation more easily. Uh, and this might be beneficial for catching prey above and below uh, uh, the, the living cephalopod. Uh, so this is uh, the, my last slide. This is the conclusions here. Uh, I've highlighted two stability maneuverability trade-offs across the morphous space. And on the top, we have uh, some earlier uh, uh, interpretations of life habits across the morphous space, where serpenticones have been historically identified as plankton. Uh, same thing with spheracones, but specifically vertical migrants. And these oxycones, which are generally more streamlined, have been considered uh, nectin. And it, it turns out that none of these animals are built for speed, really. Um, speed is not the only metric of performance for these living animals, so I wouldn't classify any of them as plankton. Uh, so instead of considering differences in life habits, I've, uh, I've plotted these physical, physical constraints on life habits instead. And I want to reiterate that there's no single optimum conch morphology. If that were the case, then evolution selection would present us with only oxycones. And yes, we see oxycones iteratively evolve, sometimes in parallel. We, we see that there, are, there, there appear to be selective stresses that uh, select for these streamlined morphologies, but we, we also see the iterative evolution of these morphotypes that have been historically interpreted as hydrodynamically inferior. Uh, we, we, we see uh, specifically in the Triassic-Jurassic an abundance of serpenticones, um, and we see that after every mass extinction, uh, the occupation of the morphous space uh, shifts and then repopulates, and sometimes it does this in new regions. So these animals are excellent tools because they have these distinct biomechanical properties to figure out uh, what sorts of properties were being selected for during uh, during and, and uh, between mass extinctions and other environmental perturbations. Uh, the next steps would be to explore thrust angle sensitivity. So the uh, sensitivity to jetting in a particular direction, especially for these unstable morphotypes. And uh, also I've only talked about first order shell shape. I haven't talked about differences in soft body morphology, uh, differences in ornamentation because there are uh, uh, plenty of aminoids that have uh, some pretty extreme ornaments uh, and the uh, coarseness of the ornamentation varies from really coarse like this to really fine ribbing. Uh, and some preliminary experiments that we're doing suggest that the coarse ornamentation may have dampened rocking. So it's a secondary stability mechanism in the absence of hydrostatic stability, which is interesting because we more often see serpenticones have more coarse ornamentation and they're less hydrostatically stable. So it's compensating for the lack of hydrostatic stability by providing hydrodynamic stability. Uh, so I found that fascinating. And so far we've only done experiments on a smooth and uh, heavily ornamented model. So it'll be interesting seeing the full spectrum of ornamentation coarse, coarseness and how that influences movement. And for the very fine ornaments, uh, it's been hypothesized and shown by some experiments that uh, it may increase boundary layer turbulence, which reduces overall drag, similar to the dimples on a golf ball. So there might be a trade-off there between uh, drag reduction, and that at a certain point it increases more hydrodynamic drag for a particular movement in a particular direction, but improves uh, rocking attenuation. 
Uh, so that's uh, a, a, an exciting next step for this research. And also, um, I am uh, uh, haven't signed a contract yet, but I'm pretty sure I will be uh, a postdoc next year at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. And I'll be working with a group that specializes in soft robotics. So I'm excited to be able to integrate uh, soft robotics and smart materials with more advanced biomimetic robots. And real quick, I want to give a special thanks to Robert Lemanis for sharing the CT scan Nautilus, uh, the Crimson Lagoon staff at the University of Utah for letting us do experiments in their pool, uh, and also the National Science Foundation for funding this work. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Feel free, folks, to unmute yourselves if you have a question. I got a few of them for him, so I'm going to I'm going to start, David. All right. Where do I start? No. Uh, question number one. This is like you're on a game show now. Did you come to uh, paleontology via engineering and physics, or mm -hmm. did you become a an, an engineer and physics guy because you love ammonites and were curious about them? Uh, kind of the latter. Um, I, I've always been interested in fossils. I've always, uh, I, I, I'm quite the, the collector. So uh, I, I've been doing that ever since I was a kid. Um, and when I started college, I wasn't sure if I wanted to, to go the paleo route. So I majored in, majored in geology. I took a lot of the, the quantitative courses and then decided I wanted to get a master's in geophysics. So that definitely improved my, my uh, quantitative outlook in this area. And then I went full circle and decided to get a PhD in paleontology and applied uh, physics and engineering techniques to, uh, the, uh, the, to, to answer uh, questions in paleontology and, and paleoecology. Pretty, pretty damn interesting. Very good. Thanks. I'm going to let someone else give a question. I hope there's not a quiz on this material. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the question. Oh uh, yeah. Um, this is way above my education, but were these all done in a still body of water? And if so, will it be repeated with a body of water with waves to see how it functions? Uh, so these experiments were uh, they they were performed in pools. Uh, and for in, in each of these settings, we did experiments far from the returns, the jets of, of uh, that, that uh, recycle the, the, the filtered water back into the pool. Uh, but they still experienced random ambient currents. And we, we wanted it uh, to be a little bit chaotic because despite all of this chaos, when we look at certain kinematic properties like velocity or rotation or whatever, uh, they are incredibly repeatable despite interacting with those random chaotic currents that influence the models in any particular direction. Uh, so this, this isn't necessarily indicative of uh, a, a setting with a high wave action, but there's still, uh, this, this uh, allows us to experiment uh, in environments that have uh, chaotic initial conditions. And we wanted that on purpose. Thank you. I'm just curious if the 3D models are, are publicly available. Uh, for uh, the uh, each of the, the the robots and the hydrostatic models I just presented on, uh, those are uploaded with Zenodo, and uh, a DOI and link to that will be available in the manuscripts. That one of them is uh, uh, just gone through review, which was generally positive. Um, and I suspect that uh, they'll both be out during the summer. Uh, so if, if, if people wanted, they could 3D print their own robots if they use the exact same uh, slicer settings and materials that I did, uh, but also just the external models, uh, being able to 3D print those for teaching specimens or the hydrostatic models, being able to use those to uh, 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 piggyback with a, a, a different set of analyses, that'll all be freely available, yes. And some of the models that I use for teaching specimens, I also plan to uh, upload those to a repository somewhere as well. Sure, that'd be fabulous. Uh, with these ammonites you were you testing, uh, how, big are, how big were they? 
So they all have the same volume and mass. It corresponds to about uh, a kilogram. Uh, it's a little, I, I kept saying that throughout the presentation, but it's actually a little bit less. It's about uh, 0.89 kilograms. And the reason I chose that number is because when designing the robots, I had, uh, a, I, I just uh, made the electronic components. Uh, and then I, I had to essentially play Tetris with them to figure out how to package them in the smallest possible area. And the smallest shell, the more the most space constraints on diameter was the spherocone. Since it has the same volume as everything else, that means it has to have the, the smallest diameter. So the smallest diameter for that was exactly uh, 15 centimeters. So all of the other models uh, have diameters that correspond to the volumes of a 15 centimeter diameter spherocone. So for the oxycone and serpenticone, they were somewhere around 20, 22 centimeters. And then uh, the spherocone and, and uh, center were 15 and 17 centimeters in diameter. Uh, but yeah, okay. that, that brings uh, up a good point that hydrodynamics and uh, specifically hydrodynamic drag and, 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 and efficiency of particular shapes changes with scale. So if you have a, a, a namonite that was just born, uh, consider something that's uh, mil millimeters in scale uh, maybe maybe to a few centimeters, more inflated morphologies are more efficient. Uh, so they actually experience uh, lower drag being more inflated. And then once they get bigger, then more laterally compressed morphologies have lower drag coefficients. So the dynamics of, of scale is something that we're really interested in. And uh, with robots, it's, it's right now it's just not feasible to make them much smaller than they already are. But uh, here at the university, we have engineers that have uh, 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 an omni-magnet array. An omni-magnet is something where it's a, a series of, of uh, electromagnets, and you could uh, impart very accurate forces on another magnet if you know its dimensions and magnetic susceptibility. Uh, and and they, they have such degree of accuracy that they could use these to do eye surgery. So the idea is if instead of doing robots, we could make models that have magnets at their hyponomes and then explore uh, their response to the same jet thrust, which is scaled down by size. So that's another way to do physical experiments uh, that, that will actually, uh, where we could actually investigate the dynamics of, of scaling. But I suspect that that's way later down the road because that's a very involved experiment. Hey, David, yeah, uh, uh, David can, I, can I ask you to uh, unshare your screen so we can see oh. people and they can raise their hands? Of course, yep. And, yeah, cool. And at that point, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to follow up with the other question about rougher water and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so which ones are these guys, from your, from your experience, which ones, which shape do you think would be better for, say, coastal rough water as opposed to you know, just below the wave base, way out in the Pelagic Ocean. Two, uh, two opposite extremes of the ocean, I guess. So, of the ocean. Uh, there, there have been a, there's there's been a lot of work on identifying patterns of covariation in cephalopods, where we often have these streamlined morphotypes, like Sphenodiscus, for example, in the Western Interior, um, and also the Atlantic Coastal Plain. Uh, we have these more compressed morphologies uh, in more proximal paleo environments. Uh, so presumably they were living in higher energy environments where hydrostatic stability would be beneficial. Uh, however, the exact opposite trend has been reported by other workers. So it's not really clear if this is uh, a true pattern of covariation in terms of uh, interspecific variation, but also this has been document documented as in uh, intraspecific variation. So more often we have um, certain uh, uh, patterns represented by uh, more e-volume morphologies, more openly coiled morphologies having more coarse ornaments. And those are found in these more distal paleo environments. Uh, so uh, if I were to engineer the perfect aminoid that uh, uh, perform better in a more chaotic environment, it would be something that has very high hydrostatic stability, so a lower body chamber ratio, something like a sphenodiscus, uh, which means that uh, in that particular case, it would also be better suited to uh, moving, uh, ha has improved directional efficiency, uh, but also 
just from the preliminary ex preliminary experiments with ornamentation, having more coarse ornaments could also uh, not not necessarily improve their lateral movement potential, but stabilization in response to external forms of energy, either due to wave action or uh, current energy flowing past bathymetric features. So in like a reef setting. Uh, so in that case, some lower energy animals that wanted to emphasize stability could do it with ornamentation rather than hydrostatic stability. So either of those cases would be better suited to chaotic environments. Anyone else got a question? <laughs> Oh, let's see what's in the chat there. David's is bringing up huh? David's is is there a reason that the nautiloids survived? Oh, the, yes. Yeah. So um, the the reason why we we have nautilus today, which is um, certainly not an athletic sw swimmer compared to uh, most ammonoid shell shapes, and also probably their physiological differences being more colloid like and uh, uh, ha having some. Uh, advantages in terms of their soft body. Uh, the reason why we have uh, nautilids is probably has nothing to do with these biomechanical properties, but rather uh, their reproductive strategies. So aminoids produce uh, lots of eggs. They don't have a lot of yolk. Uh, they don't have a lot of resources when they hatch. They also have very thin shells that are susceptible to ocean acidification. So a mixture of, uh, of those things made them more susceptible to the end Cretaceous. Uh, uh, catastrophe, and uh, for nautiloids that not the the nautilids that survived that event, they have uh, very few offspring, but very large yolky masses that uh, they, they uh, uh, can wait out these the, these conditions in the absence of food, um, and also the uh, aminoid offspring were planktic, so they would have been higher up in the water column and more susceptible to ocean acidification that way. Uh, so a combination of those factors. Uh, but it is very strange because a lot of workers at AM&H and, &H and uh, uh, down south in, in Alabama and some other places, they're finding that it's quite common for some aminoids to survive briefly beyond the KT. So what was different about this mass extinction uh, compared to all others that completely wiped aminoids out for good, usually they're able to sque uh, squeak through. And since th they did a little bit at the end of the Cretaceous, especially with baculatids and scapatids and uh, the, the staples of the Western Interior Seaway, um, it's very surprising that they were, that uh, like what, what happens after the, the KT, we really don't know. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a mystery and it's very unfortunate. Cool. Um, we have we have a request to get a, a link to your slideshow. Oh yeah, I can uh, I uh, I can make a Dropbox link and then uh, send that yeah. your way. Yeah, and I can just send it back out. And while I'm while I'm talking about sending your links out, I'm going to remind folks that we're doing another one, our last one of the year with Kathleen Rittenbush. Ritterbush is that her name? Yeah, you work with her, I believe. Yep. On May 26th, and she hasn't given me a topic yet, but it'll be more Ammonite fun. <laughs> and I believe Bob Williams, did you have a question? I'm picking on you. I saw you raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> we can't hear you, Bob. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Turn your volume up on your computer. Okay, somebody do a voiceover for the computer. <laughs> or type it in the chat. <laughs> I can't hear you, Bob. Oh, now you're muted. Now we definitely can't hear you. I put in the chat, Bob. Uh, well, Bob is trying to figure out his question. Anybody else got a question? I, I did see one in the chat that's, uh, that says, any applications from studying aminoids to apply to engineering submersibles? 
And uh, at Max Planck, that's the, the exact direction that I want to take because these animals have, a, uh, that's why I brought up RUVs earlier, the uh, remotely operated underwater vehicles, because uh, they are generally rigid bodied. Uh, they also, a common engineering solution to make sure that they assume the right orientation is just to exaggerate hydrostatic stability so much that it, does, it doesn't even matter. But they're also sacrificing various types of maneuverability by doing this. So the idea is to figure out how aminoids have evolutionary, evolutionarily navigated this, uh, these several stability maneuverability trade-offs and see if there is any sweet spot that can be applied to RUVs or see, see if we could even have a mobile counterweight uh, device that changes depending on uh, certain types of movement for the ROUV. So for example, if we wanted to emphasize stability, we could increase hydrostatic stability if there is a, if they wanted to monitor um, the, the video footage of a marine animal or something. And then if they're just trying to navigate around, uh, then they would emphasize a more maneuverable condition. Uh, so this has applications for uh, marine biology. There's also some DOD applications, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a direction that we want to take. And also, uh, one of the things that I've proposed is uh, uh, one of the advantages of coluoid cephalopods, uh, the shell-less cephalopods like our squid, octopus, and cuttlefish, is that they're liberated from the constraints of having a rigid body, and they produce stability with their mantle fins by undulating their mantle fins and producing these mutually opposing forces that are perpendicular to the movement direction. So the idea would be to use soft robotics uh, to try to replicate that behavior as well to design better ROUVs. And uh, some of these soft robotic technologies, they, uh, uh, they, they work with 3D printed hydrogels and they're laced with liquid metals. So when you apply a charge, they uh, contract just like a muscle. So the idea is to make the soft robotic uh, muscular mantle fins inspired by a cuttlefish and see if, if uh, uh, we can provide uh, dynamic stability mechanisms that way. And with ROUVs, uh, uh, I, I want to try to make an aminoid-like uh, propulsive mechanism where they actually have a mantle cavity that contracts just like a coloid cephalopod to produce thrust instead of, instead of an impeller inside of them. Uh, so there are lots of applications there designing submersibles. Uh, any other questions? And if not, I think we'll uh, give a good virtual applause. Oh, oh wait, Bob, Bob's question came up. <laughs> right. Bob says, does the issue you had with buoyancy adjustment with the screw device suggest a rapid real-time ability to adjust the gas water ratio in the chambers when the animal moved into colder water, for example, or if this something we already knew from nautiloids? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So the, the, <laughs> mo the models uh, don't really answer that question, but some other work that I'm doing, uh, let's see, I, I don't have any of them on hand, but we've looked at the fractal-like uh, nature of aminitic septa specifically and looked at how they influence uh, liquid retention and liquid modification. And uh, it, it was uh, only a, there, there's, there's still lots of open questions with this, but the, the, the gist of this is that they are really good at retaining droplets of water in these margins with capillary forces. And when they're small, the first order features retain droplets of water better. And once they grow, the second order features and the third order features and so on start to retain uh, the, the, these droplets of water. So they have this improved capillary potential that uh, it, it's, it's uh, multifunctional on multiple scales, which is really interesting. And we haven't done any experiments on what this means for rapid buoyancy adjustment, but retaining uh, liquid in this way, they could have been used as liquid ballasts. And uh, they, they, they modify their, their liquid to gas ratios through osmosis. So that imposes a pretty harsh limit on how quickly they could modify their buoyancy. Um, so we're not really sure if having these extra ballasts was just a method for retaining mass uh, where they could uh, improve their chamber refilling potential in the, in the case of shell loss due to predation or something. Um, or experiencing differences in buoyancy because of uh, the ambient conditions of the water, like you mentioned. Um, 
or uh, if they ate uh, a, a big meal and passed it, that could change buoyancy. Uh, there, are, there are lots of ways that they had to manage buoyancy um, and that might have improved their buoyancy potential, but they certainly had increased capillary potentials over something like a Nautilus. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's all I really have to say about that for now. But eventually we want to hopefully engineer a working osmotic pump. Uh, so they'll have a, a working siphuncal inside of the chambers uh, and set probably a single chamber. Um, and then I would just uh, make an osmotic gradient by adjusting the salinity of the water passing through that, that, that organ that's made out of a permeable, permeable membrane and then the, between the liquid and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the chambers. And by adjusting that gradient, my idea is that I could make a similar osmotic gradient to what Nautilus ex experiences and then see how septal morphology changes liquid removal or, um, or, or the adding of liquid in the chambers. Uh, so that, that's, that's definitely on my radar, but that's a very involved experiment. And I, I need some better uh, osmotic membranes to do that. It'd be nice if I could, if I could 3D print with a, uh, um, a, uh, a material like that, which I think we're, we're getting there. Thanks for the question, Bob. <laughs> and I think with that, let's now give you, give David a, a virtual applause session. Great, thanks for having me. Thanks for speaking. That was great, fascinating stuff. And I'm sure that there'll be a lot more when you delve into the Diddy Mosterses of the world. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in turning these into robots and exploring some other questions. Uh, they're, they're some pretty unique Just animals. Just a headache. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch the film and laugh at it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. And thanks, everyone, for showing up. I'll